Well, good afternoon. My name is uh, Chris Smith. I'm with uh, Wolf Robotics. I'm a project manager there. Um, we're talking about uh, trends in robotics as we see it in the metal processing industry. You know, the title was in manufacturing in general, but that's a fairly broad topic. And uh, our particular business, we uh, uh, focus on metal processing. So I was gonna, I kind of focused it more on that. Um, just to give you a brief history of uh, who we are. Uh, a company that was originally founded in 1944 in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, there was an engineering company at that time uh, concentrating on building uh, farm, farming implements. Um, they eventually started uh, developing some of the early automated plasma cutting technology uh, in the 60s and 70s, and they were then purchased by ESOB, uh, who many of you may know, but a very large uh, plasma cutting equipment company, uh, make welding wire, welding consumables. Uh, located over and headquartered in uh, over in Sweden, um, they then uh, started doing robotic system integration, is what is what the industry we're in. Uh, so where they take a robot, they purchase from say ABB, who's a robot, one of the major robot manufacturers in the world. Take the robot, add all the tooling on the end of it, all the software, all the controls, engineering, all the mechanical engineering to actually make the robot do something, and then we sell into. Uh, anywhere from uh, fab shops or job shops into uh, blue chip companies such as GE, uh, Caterpillar, uh, some of our bigger customers. Uh, so with ABB, uh, that particular robot has an open architecture to it. So in terms of a history of robotics, that's very important to how robots have advanced uh, in, in their applications and use uh, today and continue to do so. Um, and so a lot of the early stuff that we do now was, uh, a lot of that was uh, started to be de developed when we worked with ABB and with its open architecture. A lot of the other uh, robot flat platforms, uh, like you saw FANUC, that's a fairly closed architecture, so fairly limited in what you can actually do with them uh, in industrial applications. Um, then in 2003, uh, ABB decided to divest themselves of their system integration business and then concentrate solely on manufacturer robots. So we uh, became a private company at that time. Uh, and then since then grew and were then more, most recently purchased by uh, Lincoln Electric uh, last year. So currently we're about uh, uh, 110 plus people. Uh, we're located in Fort Collins, Colorado, as I said. Uh, we uh, have an installed base of over 8,000 robots. Uh, today, uh, our annual volume of robots is uh, much less than that 8,000, you would think. Uh, we used to do a lot of work in the automotive industry, uh, but now really don't do any work there. It's uh, much more in uh, high-end, highly engineered systems. So if you look at our niche in the industry, one of the things that defines us is we, our, our revenue per robot is very high. Uh, so we only, are, we only have about 50 robots that we uh, um, sell in any, in any one year. Like on the right gives you a good example of a system that would be uh, used to weld the big mining equipment uh, piece there. So the robot by itself, you can see there, a uh, very pretty small part of the overall system, so we add a lot of additional content to it. But if we look at the uh, history of, of robots and their characteristics, uh, they really kind of defined down to four major areas. Um, if we look at them, payload and force are kind of combined together. Uh, is one, one characteristic. Adaptability, uh, or sometimes referred to as intelligence. Um, the other thing that's uh, characteristic of a robot is its flexibility, and then its accuracy and stiffness. So since the advent of uh, electric robots uh, back in the uh, late 1970s, the capabilities in these areas have all increased uh, over time with, uh, with robots as they're currently uh, uh, sold. Um, and with that, uh, if you look at manufacturing processes, they, they have various requirements in each of these different areas. So uh, adaptation of uh, robots in any one manufacturing process or industry has been uh, continually increasing over time as robots have gotten better and better and more capable. I'll just kind of put up some history uh, up here. Uh, early applications for electric robots were mostly isolated to material handling. Uh, if you pick up a large part, preciseness is not really all that important. So it was fairly easy to get a robot to do that back in the 1970s. Um, then automotive industry, as you may all know, uses a large, very large number of robots, and they were one of the early adopters. Uh, spot welding was one of the major processes. Again, it's not a very precise process. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of stiffness requirements. Uh, location precision is not, uh, not ne <coughs> required nearly as much as some other processes. In the 1980s, I show there, that's an arc welding, uh, gas metal arc welding robot. That was when uh, really 
Uh, most of the uh, early arc welding development with robotics was done was in the 1980s, and now it's a commonplace uh, process for robots. Um, early applications were mostly isolated to high volume applications, but now as robots have gotten more adaptable, more intelligent, we're able to put them into lower volume applications where they're more adaptable uh, to handling different parts, part variation and whatnot. Uh, 1990s, uh, it's a picture of a laser cutting robot. Uh, there with laser cutting, uh, you want to make a, a round hole. Uh, back in the 1980s, you'd make an uh, egg-shaped hole. So as the robots got <coughs> more, a more accurate and stiffer, we were able to uh, make round holes instead of uh, ovals. Uh, so that was in the 1990s. You saw a lot of uh, laser welding, or laser cutting, actually laser welding as well was another process that was developed at that point. <coughs> in the later 1990s into the 2000s, the picture in the top center there, uh, that's a very large positioner uh, for a, <coughs> for a uh, uh, caterpillar frame, one of their vehicles. Um, when you get into these very large parts, there's a lot of variation. Uh, when early robots, when they were programmed, all they did was the same thing over and over and over again. They had very little intelligence to them or adaptability. So that was one of the things that was really required to be able to get, to be able to uh, uh, successfully weld uh, frames and whatnot for very large vehicles. Uh, then down there in the bottom right, I put a picture of a friction stir welding robot. Um, that's a relatively new process for robotics. Uh, requires a high pay or high force capability. Until the early 2000s, you just couldn't find a robot that had enough uh, force capability or payload enough to do friction stir welding. Then the top right there uh, shows a, a machining robot, and you're now starting to see robots enter the machining market uh, as now they're becoming stiffer and more accurate. Uh, they do not, they're not going to replace uh, uh, CNC any, anytime soon, uh, all of them, but uh, uh, you're seeing inroads into that manufacturing process as well. And then the bottom right end I'm showing there is uh, uh, additive manufacturing, which is a lot of interest in that uh, universally, but for a robot to do that, it's a great uh, machine because it's low cost, but uh, the way it's programmed is, uh, is, uh, uh, makes it difficult to implement that in that um, application, but we're doing a lot of work in that area to try to uh, make that uh, work out much better. Um, it's maybe part of the history of, of robots. They are generally uh, considered repeatable machines, but they're not accurate machines compared to CNC. So in the early days, if you wanted to say, weld this along, make a path along here, you may have to end up actually programming it to be offset because it was not able to maintain the accuracy, but it was a repeatable machine. Uh, so that accuracy and, uh, becomes more and more important as you start to get into additive manufacturing as well. Uh, if you look at uh, most processes that are, end up being uh, automated with robots, uh, a lot of them start out manual. They then transition into uh, custom automated machines or custom engineered machines, and then they eventually go over to robotics. Uh, that's, uh, machining is a good example of that. You're just starting to see robotic applications for machining. And the, one, the reason that ends up happening is robots are um, much lower cost machines. They're, they're produced in uh, very significant volumes. The annual uh, production now is around 100,000 units a year for robots throughout the world, and China is now the largest user or uh, user of uh, robots now. All right. So, in terms of force and capability, or force capability, just put a simple graph up there. But robots are now able to uh, have payloads uh, in excess of 1,300 kilograms, so they can be picking up small cars now. Uh, just show an example of a large robot picking up a train wheel and then another one doing friction stir welding. Um, in terms of adaptability, this is mostly focused in our industry. Um, there's uh, seam finding equipment. We can do that with lasers. Uh, we can do that with touch sensing. We can, if with cast metal arc welding with the wire, we put a voltage through it. And once we contact the metal surface, we can determine where it is. So for very large parts where you have a lot of part variation, we can then go and search for these, uh, where the actual weld needs to be uh, before we actually start. Uh, that's a uh, non-real-time solution. There are also real-time solutions where you can actually track uh, while you're welding. You can use the uh, use lasers for doing that. You can also use the uh, arc, arc voltage and impedance uh, to track a joint as well. Um, there's uh, other things in that area as well. You know, part identification where we're into uh, what we refer to as high mix, low volume. We want to understand what part we're, we're welding. Um, also locating features on various different parts. So. 
Uh, we're working on applications now that are uh, essentially there's infinite variations, so the robot can then go in there and identify what, what it actually has to weld. <coughs> and sometimes we use vision cameras. That's much more used in other industries, other robotic solutions. Um, so this gives you an idea of some of the adaptability requirements that, that we run into. Uh, show you a very, very large uh, V-groove weld uh, down there. Be uh, something for a uh, typical of a mining equipment. That's probably, <coughs> excuse me, a 50-pass weld. Uh, that may, those, those uh, joints may open up and close. That angle may change over, over, uh, over the length of that there. So we have ability to go along that joint, scan it, and then adapt the welding process as we go along to make sure it's consistently filled, uh, similar to what a, uh, a human being would do. Oops. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so one of the other things I mentioned uh, uh, early, early there was uh, positioning equipment. So early on robots, they were five axis robots and then they became six. But that was all you had was a six axis robot moving around. But when you're welding, uh, oftentimes it's uh, nice to keep the, uh, the joint in the, uh, 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 with, in the same position with respect to gravity all the time. So what we do is one of the um, big areas that uh, one of the things we're known for is building very large positioners. So as, uh, as the, the part is welded, it's, uh, it's turned and rotated and adjusted in position uh, to keep the robot, keep the robot uh, being able to weld uh, with gravity uh, being, uh, helping it out rather than if you're welding up overhead, then the, the weld wants to fall down. So that's a very important uh, thing for uh, welding very large parts. Uh, so the robots themselves have to have <coughs> The ability to control. Uh, we've done up to 12 axis many times. Uh, and then part of the challenge with that, you, you know, with six, six axis robot, it's, uh, you have the uh, three degrees of uh, positional freedom X, Y, Z, and then the three orientations. So essentially there's always one known solution where you start getting into these large positioners and there becomes uh, infinite solutions that you have to be able to resolve. <coughs> well, a lot of things, this is uh, last, uh, five, ten years or so, uh, you're looking at a lot of robot, robotics that will be doing uh, multiple processes. When you get into this high mix, low volume area, there's simply not enough welding, for example, to keep a robot busy all the time. So in a lot of these large parts, they require preheating, so they've got a torch doing that. They also need to be ground as part of the process as well. Uh, and there's a needle descaling tool over there. So robots doing a lot more uh, activities or processes, a uh, single robot doing that. Um, so we get into this high mix, low volume arena uh, where we're having every part we do is almost different. Almost everyone is different. We need to have fixturing that's adaptable as well. And these things can be also be controlled by robots uh, as well if we put additional uh, servo motors on them. <coughs> also important when you're doing this high mix, low volume work uh, is to be able to take the parts in and out quickly. Of the, of the robot. You know, the robot makes money when it's welding. It doesn't make any money when it's sitting there doing nothing. So if we find ways to get, uh, make the uh, robot keep welding, that's a good thing. <coughs> um, one of the newer th things you're seeing now is uh, an area called collaborative robotics. Uh, so this is, an, this is a situation where, uh, where the human being is actually working with the robot. We don't personally do a lot of this work. Uh, you're seeing it mostly in material handling, uh, but uh, you know one of the things you could envision for a, ro a robot is what these robots do. They can be moved around uh, by your by yourself. They've got uh, torque and sensing in each of the arms, so they can be they essentially they're self balancing, so that you can actually draw it, uh, just pull, haul it around and teach it the weld path. Also, <coughs> so for situations where um, you don't have a lot of good welders, uh, you can still have a robot, and it's a simple process of then taking the robot and then teaching it what to weld quickly. Um, <coughs> another thing I uh, show over here is that that's a uh, camera. Uh, that one of the technologies we've developed uh, times the, uh, the, all the, the pictures or the video with uh, the pulsing of the weld process, so it allows you to really see the weld. Uh, so that's an, an area where the human being can also be involved uh, with the robot itself. So there's a, there is a category of applications out there where uh, it's nice to have a human being still involved, where the adaptability is still, uh, level is still too much for robots to, uh, to handle. But again, primarily mostly in the uh, material handling industry, you're seeing these kind of robots. 
All right, and then uh, in terms of uh, programming, this is one of the things that's uh, changing a lot right now. Um, so early days, um, sec, it's really the second one, you were, you were doing all your programming with the robot, you were doing it online. So you had a teach pen with the robot. Uh, because it wasn't an, it's not a very accurate machine, there was no way to do any CAD CAM work. So there really hasn't been any CAD CAM or what we call CAD CAR until very recently. Uh, just because robots are not accurate. So you would teach, you would take the robot and manually jog it around to its, through its whole path and teach it all its positions. <coughs> um, so then there became uh, means of doing this work offline, starting in about the late 1990s and early 2000s. So you could, engineer could be working at his desk uh, and programming the robot uh, through a robot simulation software and then be able to download that and run the program much more quickly than you would, would if you had to program it online. And that was an important innovation for helping work with these, these high mix, low volume applications because we simply couldn't afford uh, the time to program the robot uh, online because it wasn't welding, wasn't making you money. Um, and then as robots have come, their open architecture, more, more adaptability, uh, parametric programming uh, has become uh, quite common nowadays as well. Where that, I mean, I just may give a simple example. If you're welding a bunch of boxes, right, you could make a program based on x, the two, two length, the length and the width of the, of the box, and then the program could be created automatically. So that's what we refer to as parametric programming. And then more recently, uh, we're developing technologies to fully automate the programming process. And this is, gonna, it, this is becoming very important for things like additive manufacturing where the process times are immense. Uh, you have, uh, literally you could have millions of points on a program. And so if you wanted to do that offline or online with the robot, it was just completely impractical. So there needs to be ways to really do what CAD, the equivalent of CAD CAM. Uh, and at the part of the challenge is robots are still nowhere near as accurate as a CNC machine. So there's lots of things we're working, we work on to uh, help that uh, and make that a reality. Uh, so just some examples of offline programming. This is kind of the pictures of the environment that the uh, engineers, robot engineers work in so they can program these parts. Um, here's an example of parametric programming. Um, on the left, uh, we call that click and clad. Uh, so that's uh, a lot of cladding applications where you need to uh, put a hard, hard code surface on there. So something like that, though it's a fairly small part, you could have very large parts, that would be very difficult to program manually. So it's uh, programmed parametrically, as you imagine. The, radius of the sphere, the uh, step over distance would be parameters in that particular application. And on the right shows a uh, friction stir processing application. That's a, a nickel aluminum bronze propeller, uh, which they were doing repair work on. And so those, those are raster patterns that were spirals of uh, rectangles or circles. So, that, uh, so if you parameters there, get length, width, step over, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so this just gives an example here of uh, what we're you know, looking at for uh, additive manufacturing application. It's a longer video, I'll, I'll stop it here, but you can, if you imagine every, every corner on that thing and every pat, every uh, layer is an individual point in the robot program. That would be immensely difficult or time consuming to do that all, all manually. It's also, uh, the thing is you need to have some level of preciseness on your, uh, on your, on your, your your layers as you go up, and that's just not really possible to do if you did that all, all manually. So, and then, okay, go oh, yeah. ahead. No. <laughs> that thing takes probably hours to, hours to make. No. But it also shows you know, machining. Uh, that, in that case, that's a uh, car, uh, carbon fiber, fiber uh, reinforced plastic. Uh, so that's some of the additive stuff we're working on. So in this particular case, uh, we take CAD models and we slice them up and then we create, all the, create the program automatically from that. There's another, another example on the right. Um, we're also looking at doing this with uh, gas metal arc welding process, and Frank showed a slide of something uh, similar to that. But it all, the same, same uh, tools apply, whether you're using a, a, a extruding a plastic or whether you're uh, using a welding wire. Right. So this just gives a little more uh, detail what we're looking at for uh, the completely automated uh, pr programming process here. So what we're looking at is taking a CAD model uh, and then generating weld programs from it. Uh, the industry which we're targeting this for is the shipbuilding industry. We've got a panel shown for ship there. No, no one, there's very few ships that are repeated in, in production, so they're usually one-off. 
So uh, with, so we're working with the, the CAD companies to develop uh, welding information, getting that put into the CAD model, and then allowing the robot to be able to automatically program all the paths from that. And this gets, what we're doing here, there are some companies out there to do this more parametrically based, but we're doing it uh, completely automated. And one of the challenges is most of these large applications, you, uh, what we show on the right there is a robot on a three axis gantry. So you have this uh, situation where you have nine axes of motion, so you have infinite solutions. Uh, and you've also got infinite solutions when you're welding. You don't just have to weld uh, with the torch vertical. You have some flexibility in your, in your torch angles as well. So there's uh, all the software back behind that is able to resolve all those infinite solutions and uh, come up with optim optimal paths. So, yeah, I'm almost done here. So yeah, and then just quickly here. So accuracy, that's another thing that's uh, uh, of interest with robotics. As we say, we're doing, starting to see machining being done. Machining requires accuracy. Robots, because they're, um, you know, uh, serial arm machines are never going to be uh, as stiff as a CNC machine, but there are things like we can put uh, link arms on the back. It used to be that you s robots used to always have link arms because they couldn't make them repeatable enough. That went away in the 90s, and now they're coming back because people want to start doing machining with these things. On the right shows a uh, parallel armed robot. They tend to be stiffer. But they have relatively small working envelopes, so they're not really practical in a lot of applications. But these guys, for you know, semiconductor manufacturing, they're quite popular uh, for that, but not in the welding industry. <coughs> also, accuracy, um, teaching the robot uh, local coordinate systems is one of the tools that we use. Uh, instead of being, uh, <coughs> the robot's going to be much more accurate in a small area. Um, so that's how we can improve the accuracy a lot. Uh, there's other tools out there. This shows a, a laser tracking system on the robot. Uh, there's a, uh, a receiver and sender there, and that you can go through up front when you build the robot. You can then create a cloud of errors, or, and then also work on uh, adjusting the kinematic model and optimizing it for the actual application. Uh, uh, th this can be done statically. Uh, it's been done statically for a few years. There's people now looking at doing it dynamically in real time while it's actually processing. Um, other things that are lo being looked at, uh, you know, with robot, as you might imagine, you know, you're sticking away out here, it's going to deflect a lot more than if it's in, in here. So that's another way of trying to improve the uh, accuracy of a robot is to look at the uh, modeling the deflection. Uh, and that can be static and dynamic as well. <coughs> and there's also other people are putting multiple encoders on the end of um, the arms as well. Uh, but just to summarize here, so... Um, you know, there's no reason to believe that you know, the manufacturing equipment world won't continue to transition into doing more and more robotics. Robotics production year over year continues to grow. There's no reason it won't continue to do that. And basically the reason is you're getting robots that are more flexible, higher force capability, and more adaptability. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, they are. In Michigan? Yes. Yep. So they, they're actually, so they started building controllers about a year ago, and now they're starting to build arms. So that's the first U.S. manufacturing of robots since uh, uh, Cincinnati Milcron. And they left and were out of business in the early 1990s. So. Um, uh, if you look, you know, so that's it. ABB, is ma they were, their headquarters were in Sweden, uh, and then they started manufacturing a lot of robots in China. Um, the fact of the matter is China's uh, standard of living and uh, is going up and up and up and up, and it's uh, starting to get to the point where, you know, you're having to, with the shipping costs, we're becoming more competitive again. There's a lot of inshoring going on, and, you know, we see a lot of that in our, in our, in our business as well. So. Yeah, so if you want to do additive manufacturing, say with a CNC, most of them are three-axis machines if, if they're a reasonable cost, right? Well, let's say you want to, uh, I don't know, let's, we want to additively manufacture something with a boss on the side of it. Well, with a robot, you can put positioners in there, tip the part around, and do a lot more than you can with a CNC. It's just a more flexible machine. Again, at a lower cost, it's going to eventually, it will be the machine of choice if it can be stiff enough and, or accurate enough. 
and certain, you know, there are, certainly are uh, applications now where the accuracy of the robots are still, they're not going to get there, but there are other ac applications where accuracy is not, not as critical. Uh, not really. It depends on the on the process. Most of the cost, you know, you know, if you look at the cost of a robot, a lot of it, or your uh, of your process and your robotics, a lot of it is the consumables. So your like your weld wire with arc welding, that's going to be your your high cost in the in the long run. But yes, you know, people do. There's no real number because you know we can build a million dollar system with one robot. You know, whereas our a different system integrator is going to build a one robot system for thirty thousand dollars. So there's you know, depending, it's highly dependent on your process. The robot themselves are you know anywhere from say thirty to those really large ones now they're three hundred thousand dollars. And it depends on if you're a GM, you get a you get a much better price than if you're a, a small one-off, right? <laughs> All over the map. Yep. All right. Thank you.